We come back to another lesson in the book of Leviticus. Today we will look at chapters 18 through 20. And so turn there, if you will, chapter 18 is where we'll start. If you think about being married or even meeting your spouse, uh, think about the first time you met them. Uh, you may have uh, combed your hair better than before. You may have uh, made sure you're wearing clean clothes or wrinkle-free clothes. You'd be paying attention to your approach to this person, maybe to a future spouse. And then once you get married, well, what is that? At the beginning is you're approaching them, you're trying to woo them and be with them and join them. But then once you get married, you walk together. You're hand in hand, as it were, and you walk in this relationship together. That's really the outline of Leviticus. Chapters 1 through 16 is the approach to Yahweh. How do you approach him rightly? What does he call you to do? And then chapters 17 through 27 are the, 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 the commands for what it looks like to walk with him. Now that you're in this relationship, you've approached him rightly, what does it look like to be his and to walk with him? And so we started that second half of the book, that second section of the book, last time in chapter 17. Now we'll look at a few more of those chapters in that walking with him section. And we'll start in chapter 18. In chapter 18, we're going to notice the family unit. Again, I'm not going to go through every verse of every chapter, but I do want you to see something about the family unit in chapter 18. Let's read verses 1 through 5 to start off. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules, and keep my statutes, and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord your I'm the Lord, he says. So Yahweh is, is telling the people, listen, I've taken you from Egypt. You're not to be like them. You remember the things that they did? Don't do those things. And I'm, you're here in the wilderness now, and we're about to go into the promised land. I'm going to bring you there, and you're going to see things that other nations do. Don't do as they do. You're my people. I'm your God. So the Lord is defining the rules or, or the code of holiness for his people. This is how to be his specifically. Now, We'll see in this passage a number of uh, sexual prohibitions, and you'll see the term come up over and over again, uncover nakedness. Uncover nakedness is really an idiom, a Hebrew idiom for sexual relations. So the prohibition to not uncover nakedness is not just to, to take their clothes off or to look at them being naked. It's referring to sexual relations. So there are a lot of these prohibitions against uncovering nakedness. And what's key to understand in this chapter is that it's given in terms of the family unit. Don't uncover the nakedness of your daughter. Don't uncover the nakedness of your brother or sister. It's defining the family unit by giving these sexual prohibitions. These prohibitions, as I said, define the family unit. Also, Giving children to Molech in verse 21 of chapter 18 is a way to also disrupt the family unit. So remember, these are the people of Israel. They're not to marry people from other nations because other nations will, will corrupt them. They are to grow as a people themselves. So it started with Abraham and now it grows to this people that's meant to be influencers of other cultures and the world. But they're meant to influence the world, not the world influencing them. And so it starts with a family. You protect the family, you allow the family to thrive, and then the idea is then the nation starts to grow and the nation starts to thrive. So these sexual prohibitions are given so that you can see what the immediate family unit is. You can't have sexual relationships with the immediate family members that you have. Now as you go out to your clan and your extended family, that's when those things are allowed. You can marry within those groups of people, but not with your immediate family members. So giving children to Molech was also a way that you would ruin the family. So having sexual relationships with an immediate family member would be an attack on the family. 
but also giving children to Molech would be an attack on the family and the nation as well because you're, you're, uh, you're taking away a life that was meant to grow and to influence not just the people around you, but ultimately the rest of the world. So giving children to Molech and having sexual relationships with immediate members of your family is a way to destroy the family. Violators of, uh, of, of these prohibitions would be cut off. Notice verse 29 of chapter 18. There wasn't a sacrifice for these sins. As I mentioned before, most of the sacrifices were for unintentional sins. These sins here, the, the, the penalty would be to be cut off. You are permanently no longer a member of the family, nor are you a member of this whole nation, Israel. You are cut off because you have attacked this family. You've attacked the people. You've attacked this nation. You're gone. You're not part of us. Now, chapter 19, I've just entitled it Holiness. There are a number of commands related to holiness, and I want to talk about a couple of them. Chapter 19 actually contains a, a restating of the Ten Commandments. It does more than that. There's more than just that, but it contains in it a restating of the Ten Commandments. And then I want to look at something in chapter 19 that you may have been puzzled about in the past. Let's look at chapter 19, verse 19. So Leviticus 19, 19. You shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your cattle breed with a different kind. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed, nor shall you wear a garment of cloth made of two kinds of material. Now, what's the deal with mixed fabrics? What's the deal with mixed seeds or, or mixed animals? Why that prohibition? Is God just trying to be overly harsh to show that he's just a difficult God? Well, no, not at all. Now, you might have even heard in today's day and age, people people talk to you and they might believe that homosexuality, for example, is something that is good. And you might say, well, the Bible actually forbids homosexuality. And they might, they might respond to that by saying, well, you take the Bible literally, then why do you wear things with different mixtures of fabric? So they try to point out an inconsistency. That's actually not an inconsistency. When you understand that wearing a certain kind of fabric or mixing fabrics was actually a violation of something uh, that, because it violated, well, I'll tell you in a second. I don't want to tip my hand too early. When you understand why this command is given, you understand that this no longer applies today. But when you understand why the prohibition against homosexuality is given, you do understand why that's still good for today. Let me explain. Why is the command given to not wear mixed fabrics or to join mixed animals or to, to mix the seeds? Well, when uh, a, a, an Israelite in this context, receiving this law of Moses, when they would have thought about mixing something, they would have thought about, about the most special place, the presence of God. Let me explain that. When you come into the tabernacle, you would see mixtures of different kinds of, of curtains, different kinds of materials in a curtain. As you got closer to the Holy of Holies, there were all the more mixtures of the types of curtains they were used. There were different materials that made up the curtains. Even when you came into the most holy place, where only the high priest would go once a year, you would have the cherubim, which was a mixture uh, of creatures. It was it was it had wings, but then actually it had uh, physical properties like a person as well. So there was this mixture even of the cherubim. The cherubim had wings. Men don't have wings. People don't have wings. But the cherubim also looked like people to some regard. So when you got into the immediate presence of God, you had a number of mixtures of things. And so they would have understand that mixing, joining things together, it would have reminded them of the Holy of Holies or the increased presence of God. So he's saying here, you can't just have the, these mixtures everywhere. This is something reserved for the ultimate presence of God, the sacred space. As I've said all through the study of Leviticus, sacred space was very important to Yahweh, for, for Yahweh to communicate to the people. When you, there was actually a physical location where Yahweh was said to dwelt. And, and as you approach that, the sacred space started and then it got more and more profound. And what you would see as you go into the tabernacle through to, onto the Holy of Holies, these mixtures of materials would increase to the most sacred of the sacred spaces. So that's why no mixtures. This is something reserved only for the immediate presence of God. 
That's why this prohibition. It was just a way to communicate the, the importance of not taking God lightly. That's what it's meant to communicate. So then, we, as I mentioned, the tabernacle and most holy place had mixtures. The sacred and the common was to be apparent to people. The sacred and the common were not mixed. Okay, the sacred was distinct from the common, and that's what that's trying to communicate. Now, in chapter 19, we also learn in <coughs> verse 31 <coughs> about mediums and necromancers. Why were these harmful to the people of Israel? Well, remember, who did Yahweh want the people to learn from? Himself. How did he communicate to them? How did he, how did he communicate decisions to them? Through the priests by using the Urim and Thummim. We've covered that before. So that he would, he would give this way to understand his will or to me, communicate his will to the people. So when people would go to mediums, they were basically saying, we know Yahweh's revealed stuff to us, but we want more information that Yahweh hasn't given. We want more information. So they would go to these mediums and necromancers who would seek to tap into the divine and give them answers. That was a form of spiritual adultery going away from what Yahweh was saying and trying to find something different. They didn't need that information, evidently, if Yahweh hadn't given it to them. So that's why the prohibition is given here. This is a way of keeping the people of God his people, not going to other nations, not having these sexual relationships that destroy the family. He's keeping the people of God, his people, devoted to him in his ways. Now, chapter 20, let's look at child sacrifice and homosexuality. Again, there's, there's more in these chapters, but I want to hit some of these things so you understand why they're there. Child sacrifice and homosexuality are talked about in chapter 20. Now remember, and I alluded to this earlier, remember that ever since Genesis chapter 12, Yahweh has been making this nation for himself. Chapter 11, Tower of Babel, the Lord had told these people, be fruitful and multiply, represent me on the earth. In chapter 11 of Genesis, these people said, no, we're staying here. We're going to build a tower to our own greatness, and we're going to be secure here. The Lord didn't like that. The Lord judged that, dispersed them all over the nation, all over the world, and gave them different languages. So they went out, in a sense, away from the presence of Yahweh. What does Genesis chapter 12 then teach us? Right after that, God chooses a man and says, from you, I'm going to create a nation. I'm going to give you many children, many grandchildren. I'm going to create a nation from you. And so he goes to Abram, and together with his wife, they have children, and they have children, they have children, and that's the nation of Israel. The Lord allowed that nation to thrive in Egypt, and then they were oppressed in Egypt, so he redeemed them. He promised to Abraham, I'm going to bring you, this people, to a land here. They're on the doorstep of that land here in Leviticus. They're in the wilderness about to go into that land. So the nation is growing, and they're about to enter into their land. So God is seeking to allow this nation to thrive because ultimately the goal is from this land, from this promised land, they will represent God to the rest of the world. They will show the world what Yahweh, the God of all gods, is like. They will show what his rule is like, what his reign is like, what his holiness is like. And so he seeks to protect that people. He doesn't want them to be polluted by idolatry, the idolatry of the other nations. He doesn't want them to engage in the sexual practices that destroy the nation. So that's why these rules are given. That's why there's a prohibition to child sacrifice. Because again, what happens when you sacrifice a child? You're destroying the family. You're taking a family member and wiping them out. You're also obviously engaged in idolatry, which is wrong but you're wiping out a family member, and that was viewed as destroying the family, but also when you destroy the family, you destroy the nation. So that's why these commands are given. God is meaning for this nation of people to thrive as the families thrive. So then we come to homosexuality. Homosexuality in chapter 20, verse 13. The verse reads this. If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. Why, why is homosexuality talked about here? Why is homosexuality talked about right next to child sacrifice? Well, because child sacrifice destroyed the family, but in their minds, so did homosexuality. Why? 
in their pre-scientific understanding, life was held in the man's body. The man had life. And when his sperm was deposited into a woman, then life came. So for a man to have his semen go somewhere other than the woman was really a way of ending a life. That's how they would have thought about it. They ended a life. Now we know the New Testament also speaks of sexual relationships for the purpose of pleasure as well. But here in their understanding, you had a sexual relationship with your spouse in order to have children so that the nation could grow and you, your people, could represent God to the rest of the world. That's the whole point of a family here to these people. So when a man who has life engages in a sexual relationship with another man, a life is wasted is the idea. That's how they would have thought about it. Now, these commands are to really to be understood in the sense of what if all of the people engage in these things unchecked? What would happen? The nation would be destroyed. If homosexual, homosexuality was okay, and let's say all of the hundreds of thousands of Israelite men at this time decided to go the homosexual route rather than the heterosexual route, what would happen? Well, just in a few years' time, the nation would be gone. This generation would die out and there'd be no more kids that were born. So the nation would die out. And God meant for this nation to grow and to influence the rest of the world. So that's why homosexuality then and even now is so shameful because it doesn't promote childbirth. It doesn't promote people going and ruling and reigning for Jesus Christ. It doesn't promote that. It ends that. It's an attack on the family, which is an attack on the nation. So that's what they're learning here. You can't be like the other nations that allow homosexuality. That is to destroy a family, which again destroys the nation. And this nation is the people of Yahweh that are meant to have an influence throughout the world. If left unchecked, these sexual sins would destroy the people of God. We also learn in chapter 20, verse 15, about the pro prohibitions against bestiality. It's not just that it's gross and, and, and gross to think about, but it's because you were killing a life. A man's life would be sent out of his body and it would just be destroyed. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be done with a woman so that a child was born. It, it's a way of killing it was a threat to the family and a threat to the nation. That's how they would have viewed this act. So Yahweh's teaching this people how to allow the family to thrive and the nation to grow. Leviticus 20, 26 really could be a summary of these chapters, verses 17 through 27. Listen to Leviticus 20, 26. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples, from the nations, so that you should be mine. God is giving them these prohibitions because not only is he seeking to grow them and grow the family unit, grow the nation, <coughs> but he's also giving them these things for their good. When you obey God, it's for your good. When you walk according to my statutes, you'll live by them. You'll thrive because of these things. So God is not just good to give us these prohibitions, but he's also good to make up a people for his own name. And that's what his goal is with the nation of Israel. So that's why these prohibitions are given. Now let me just get to some takeaways here. First, we are able to approach and then walk with God through Jesus Christ. Think about it. We're born in sin. We're born alienated. We're born hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, according to Colossians 1, 21 through 23. Yet, we've been reconciled back to God. We've joined God. We've been allowed to come into the Holy of Holies, been allowed to come into his presence through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And now we walk with him. So there, there, there's a mirror here between Old Testament Israel and the new covenant believer today. We are able to approach God. In reality, we shouldn't be able to approach God. We should be cast out, cut off from the rest of the world, cut off and sent to hell. But we are able to approach God through Christ, and then as believers, we continue walking with him. So the, the old covenant believer would say, I can approach God through the blood of this bull. As the high priest 
brings it to the Holy of Holies, through the blood of this animal. I can be in the presence of God, and I want to live according to his rules and his laws because I want to be different and distinct so that he would be known. There's so many similarities with that uh, when it comes to the New Testament believer. We approach God through Jesus Christ, and what do we say then? Oh, glad I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Don't need to worry about anything else. No, holiness is an opportunity to show him off to walk with him, to trust in him, to thrive, and to make him known. So there's a connection there between Old Testament Israel and New Covenant Christianity today. Sexual sin, here's another takeaway, sexual sin involves our bodies, which are temples of God. Remember, the sacred space at this time was the tabernacle. What's the sacred space today? Us. Just like you wouldn't have sexual relationships in the temple or even, God forbid, the Holy of Holies, we don't commit adultery in our bodies. This is a temple of God. So it's important to take sexual sin seriously. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians. It really, when we engage in sexual sin, we're joining Christ to a harlot, which is a horrendous thought. So sexual sin is a uniquely offensive sin to God. Sexual sin still destroys the family. Think about that. Adultery, uh, sexual abuse of children, that is destruction of the family. Children are meant to, again, grow up, even today in this culture for Christians, they're meant to grow up, to rule and reign, to take their little corner of the earth and to rule it, to reign it, to represent Jesus' lordship over it. And they're meant to make him known so that the world can be saved and reconciled to him. So when you abuse children and harm them, you're destroying the purpose for which they exist. It's the purpose for which all people exist. So sexual sin still destroys the family. To, to commit adultery against your spouse is a way of destroying the family. Again, what does the, what, what the husband and wife relationship show? According to Ephesians 5, it shows the gospel of Christ, the commitment of Christ to his people. And when you go against that, you're disrupting people's view of Christ and his people. So sexual st sin is a threat to the testimony of Christ, to making Christ accurately known in the world. Final takeaway, sexual sin among Christians threatens the family of God and diminishes his glory in the world. I just touched on this. It not only threatens the family of God, sexual sin does, it also diminishes his glory in the world. Have you ever heard people say, well, you know, Christians commit sexual sin just as much as non-Christians commit sexual sin. And that's a sad thing to hear because people are less and less enamored with Christ when they see Christians engaging in the sins of the world. So just allow this to be a call to you if you're listening. Keep the commands of God. When you keep the commands of God and walk in his ways, you show off the amazing nature of who he is and who Christ is. When you act like the rest of the world, nobody's impressed with your God. And I think when we're thinking rightly, we think we want our God to be impressive to people. We want our God to be worshiped by people, to be known by people. And that's how we live. So take, take notice of these things in the book of Leviticus and see the connections to New Covenant Christianity. And hopefully chapters 18 through 20 have been a help to you. We'll continue on next time.